Hello and welcome to a very special episode of the Nonprofit Exchange Leadership Tools and Strategies. So thrilled today to be able to welcome in the amazing and wonderful panelists today for our roundtable on the Drucker Challenge. Today we are joined by Francis Hesselbein, Joan Cole, and Paul Son. So thrilled to have you in as you join us. We're talking about some extremely important things, one being the primary legacy of Peter Drucker. want to welcome you in and let you know who's with us today on the program. So our first guest with us today is Frances Hesselbein. She is an amazing woman. She's the president and CEO of the Frances Hesselbein Leadership Institute. She is its founding president, and prior to founding the Institute, she served as the CEO for the Girl Scouts of the USA. Between 1965 and 1976, she rose from troop leader to CEO, holding the position of CEO for 14 years, and during her time, she grew the organization into a monster of a wonderful organization bringing girls in from all parts of our society. Whether you're talking rural or urban or suburban, Francis led the effort to bring girls in, to give them programming, to help them grow in their efficacy and their understanding of what it takes to be successful and to grow. In 1998, she was honored by President Bill Clinton with the Presidential Medal of Freedom uh, Award for her work with the Girl Scouts of the USA. Today, she is the editor-in-chief of the amazing uh, Leader to Leader Journal. She is author of a zillion different books, including a half dozen, it seems, behind my shoulders. She is uh, a lead author on the recently released Peter Drucker's Five Most Important Questions. So, Francis, we are so absolutely thrilled to have you in with us. Well, I am so thrilled to be with you. And, and Francis, right next to you is Joan Cole. Joan is the founder of Why Millennials Matter. She's an international speaker. She's a multi-time successful book author. She She's dabbled in both business and healthcare, but she's found her niche in mentoring and developing millennials across the country and truly across the globe. She has been mentoring millennials for a decade now, which is a beautiful message because she's only 17 herself. Uh, right. she, there you go. She has an MBA. She is a certified instructor. She does so much to lead and let organizations understand what it looks like to work with millennials. Her advice has been in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Leader to Leader Journal, Cosmopolitan Magazine has chosen her to be part of their inaugural Millennial Board of Advisors. She has been featured at amazing places like 92Y just last week. She was speaking there. She has written uh, The First Globals, Understanding, Managing, and Unleashing Our Millennial Generation with pollster John Zogby. And she is a keynote and panelist all over the country. Joan, thrilled to have you in with us. Thank you, Todd. I'm so excited to be here with all of you. Absolutely. And and last but certainly not least, we have our young man on the panel, Paul Son. Paul is a leadership consultant. He's a blogger. He's an author. He's worked with Fortune 100 companies, a great place to work company, and he's now working with Giant Worldwide as a consultant. He's been ranked as one of the top 15 uh, of the world's top 50 leadership bloggers to follow. And Paul is listed as one of the top 33 under 33 Christian millennials uh, by Christianity Today. He's pursuing a graduate degree at uh, Pepperdine University, the world's premier organizational development master's program. So, Paul, wow, we're thrilled to have you on the program as well. It's an honor, Todd. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And, and look, folks, I'm just thrilled to be here with three amazing panelists, three amazing guests, and we really want to dig into uh, some really important topics. So today, I, I want to start with a really important question, and, and I'm going to ask this of you, Francis. Francis, who is Peter Drucker? Well, Peter Drucker is, was, and is the father 
of modern management and has had the greatest impact upon leaders in all three sectors with hundreds of books and films and videos all bringing the Drucker philosophy alive to leaders at every level across the organization. And he distilled the language of leadership with maxims such as think first, speak last. Mm -hmm. And another one I love is ask, don't tell. And that could be translated into any language and moves easily around the world. And when Peter Drucker stated, your mission should fit on a t-shirt, he began a not so quiet revolution that we continue to celebrate, to share in today. Absolutely, absolutely. It's an amazing thing and we look at the lasting legacy of Peter Drucker and what are we seeing Francis when you think about that you you obviously had the the wonderful experience of not just a partnership and working alongside him but a, a great friendship what do we think of as, as Drucker's legacy today what is he what do we still see today when Peter Drucker distilled the language of leadership and when he moved his three questions across all three sectors. What is our mission? Who is the customer? What is the customer value? And once we had published it, celebrated it, put it on posters, he said, no, no, there are five questions. And I, what is our mission? Who is the customer? What is the customer value then? What have been our results and what is our plan? He said, if you don't end up with a plan, a good time was had by all, and that is all. Absolutely. It's a beautiful thing. and it, It's interesting because here we are. We've got Paul, who's a millennial. I'm a cusper. And, Joan, I think you're right in that cusper level, just maybe on the X side, if I'm right. But each of us have been profoundly impacted by the legacy of Peter Drucker. It's one of those things that we, we start to think about what has been passed down to us over the years. I'm going to tell you a real quick snippet. I am reading currently right now Innovation and Entrepreneurship by Peter Drucker. It's a book that came out in 1984. I was three years old. And yet, the things that Peter Drucker talks about in that book are the same key areas that are being talked about in organizations all across the world in those three sectors. So, Francis, you hit the nail on the head. Yes, and we continue. Even after Peter passed, we changed the name. We began as the Peter Drucker Leadership Institute, but to us, it is still the Peter Drucker Institute, and our job is to move Peter across the country and around the world. And speaking of moving around the world, we've got something really important that we want to be talking about, which is the, du the Drucker Forum. Uh, Joan, talk to us a little bit about what this Drucker Forum is and the, the corresponding Global Drucker Challenge. It is so exciting. Um, our partnership, the Francis Hesselbein Leadership Institute, is a, a huge fan and supporter of the Global Trucker Challenge and the International Trucker Forum. It's actually the International Forum is one of the leading management congresses in Europe and so it brings together extraordinary dynamic leaders of every sector um, talking about Peter's philosophies and this is now going into I believe this is the uh, seventh, the sixth year and also a part of this, so this International Forum takes place in Peter's birthplace in Vienna, Austria in November of each year and you can see the dates November 5th and 6th. It's also live streaming so I wanted to share that that those of us that um, can't be there in person you can experience it online as, as Francis and I did this past year it's an extraordinary forum of, of really um, innovative thinking but also to our point talking about how Peter's wisdom is still timeless 
So what we were excited about sharing today is this huge opportunity for millennials to grow as a community of followers of Drucker, but also compete for an opportunity to be at the forum in Austria. There's also a cash prize as well. And what it's based on, this global Peter Drucker challenge, it shares the same mission that, that we have that Francis spoke to, which is really to expose new emerging leaders to Peter's work and then have them make it relevant to themselves, what they're seeing, what their experiences, what their goals are. And so it's an essay competition, and there are two categories. There's one for students, and there's one for young professionals. And this year, the topic is managing oneself in the digital age, the human side of technology. So basically, what you need to do is to submit an essay, 1,500 to 3,000 words, outlining your perspective and your experiences on this topic. And if you go to both um, the Institute's website uh, why Millennials Matter or directly to the DruckerChallenge.org where you can find all the information. It's suggested that you download um, a copy of the chapter that Peter wrote about managing oneself. And I know we're going to talk about that a little bit further, but that's a great starting point for all of you that want to enter the competition is to read Drucker's Managing Oneself and then start to think about how you'd apply that to that topic. Mm -hmm. Uh, Joan, I think somebody actually was calling in for a second because they were really intrigued uh, by participating. They, they just got right on the phone. And let me stop for just a second and let you know if you're on the Center Vision webpage, you can chat, you can ask some questions there, and that will be an opportunity whether we can answer them live on air or answer them after the fact. It will be an opportunity for you to be able to engage with Francis or Joan, Paul, or myself in going forward with that. Great, and um, I wanted to say, very important, that the deadline is July 15th, so we, we are really excited and, and anxious to spread the word about the challenge and get on uh, online today to answer any questions and talk a little bit about it, but um, I, I think that one thing that, that we're going to find extraordinary is that as Francis and I have been traveling and talking to college students, how much our recent book, The Five Questions, um, has really... Uh, has really been relevant and really valuable and um, and interesting to today's students and young professionals. Uh, we can't wait to hear the type of thinking that will evolve out of this out of this contest. Yeah, and I want to point out to anybody that's sitting uh, watching from work or their uh, home office or wherever they may be as they uh, take this in archive form, the, the new edition of Peter Drucker's Five Most Important Questions has really taken and distilled down these great five questions that Francis referred to earlier, and it broke them into some really important pieces. So we, we know some of the lasting and legacy leaders like Marshall Goldsmith and Jim Collins and others of that nature who have really, uh, you, you see the legacy of, of Peter Drucker living in them. But we've also seen in this edition, we've seen millennials be engaged to deep dive into these important questions. And I think that's something that's really important. And I just kudos to the two of you, Francis and Joan, for taking that next step to think about how do we make this, these concepts accessible to each generation as they go forward. I know Paul and I have both really enjoyed the book and thinking about those questions. I said the questions are simple, but they're certainly not easy. And I think you've done a wonderful job and making that accessible for us. So I, I want to take that next step because, uh, Joan, you talked about kind of the question that, that serves as the, the Drucker challenge question, which is what does it look like to manage oneself in the 21st century? Uh, I, I really want to dig into the first that concept of, of managing oneself. And, and Francis, if you would, talk a little bit about what does it mean to manage oneself? Well, managing oneself is a millennial concept. It is the millennials' language that we have all just grabbed, but it began with millennials. My generation, perhaps yours, did not think so much as manage oneself as unleashing or liberating oneself. But self-management is a contemporary term. 
most managers are comfortable with it, and they can chart the work within the concepts. Others prefer language that uses the concepts of leadership rather than management, but we understand what it really means to manage oneself. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting thing, and obviously you bring up that shift and how we think about it. Joan, would you kind of, if you don't mind, touch on how is the concept really shifted in, into the 21st century? Because we're living in, in the, the challenge even talks about a digital age. What does that look like? Well, what I love about our youngest generation, the work faith, Place, millennials today is that they are hungry for and craving leadership resources. Mm -hmm. They aspire to be somebody who makes a difference. Their definition yeah. of success is through personal fulfillment. So they want that greater role. Now when you think about the role of technology in all of this, um, what we talk to students a lot about and young professionals is how important it is to be conscientious of your personal brand. Mm -hmm. Because your brand lives in three places. It's, it's in person how you present yourself and how you connect personally. It's on paper, still the traditional ways of, of, of resumes and portfolios, but third, it's online. Mm -hmm. And really thinking about how you share your own thought leadership. And, and when we talk to students today, we tell them that everybody has something to contribute. Everybody has something to share. And to Francis's point about how millennials, this is the millennial language, managing oneself, um, Peter himself in, in the essay Managing Oneself talks about how you can look at your own strengths, how you can ask for feedback and why that's a really good thing is to get other people's perspectives and how you can continue to shine by evolving those skills into greatness uh, versus feeling overwhelmed by your weaknesses. He talks about how to figure out where you belong, um, what your contribution is, and so that deeper sense of, you know, who am I, what's my role in this world, is completely a, a complement to what, what we know um, students and young professionals and millennials are craving today. And so I think really using social media technology, like we're doing today, mm -hmm. to spread those messages around the world to their peers, to new audiences, is um, what makes this time really exciting. Yeah, I think that's such an important thing because we obviously, we've seen a shift with the millennial generation. We've got this massive boom and, and they're technology um, savvy, not, not just technology savvy, it's so intuitive to them. They've grown up, we've grown up with this. Paul, Paul, what are you seeing? You're a millennial here. We've kind of kept you quiet for a little while. Uh, which kudos to you because they say millennials can't keep quiet, right? <laughs> teasing, only teasing. Oh, what are you seeing? Well, I think, you know, as Joan said, um, you know, millennials are wrestling with the issue of managing yourself in this digital age. Um, and honestly, I think we're living in a very noisy world. Our, our uh, generation are plugged in 24-7. We're constantly bombarded with messages and images of what our friends are doing on social media. So there's one interesting study that I found that uh, 7 out of 10 millennials are experiencing FOMO, which is fear of missing out. And this is an anxiety that uh, you see when you have friends on your Facebook or Instagram or it seems like they're having this time of their lifetime and you think to yourself, like, what, what am I doing here, right? Like, I, I want to be there. I want to be doing all this. So instead of le leading your lives based on who you are, you're, you're basing your lives based on the expectations and the pressures of this world. So one question I think as millennials that could really be helpful to ask ourselves is, what is it like to be on the other side of you? And I think that's a really important question for us to think about. And, and really having the discipline to unplug ourselves uh, in this electronic social media world and start really going back to the basics and journaling and thinking about who I am, what are my tendencies, you know, what are my strengths. And, and uh, you know, one thing that has helped me particularly is creating this personal board of directors and being able to, you know, identify mentors and coaches around me. And through these conversations, I discover who I am. I discover my strengths. 
and with the concrete feedback that they give me, it, it just helps me to discover who I really am. So yeah, that's a great point. Um, that's a great point. Uh, when I speak to groups of millennials and I say yes, every chance I have because it's so fascinating um, having, because it's circular. Mm. And they are stunned when I say few study center has found that today 18 to 28 are more like the 1930s and 1940s than any cohort since, and we call the 30s and 40s the greatest generation. And they're stunned. And they often ask me, could you repeat that, please? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I know, Francis, you've often talked about the millennials, uh, or at least we, we shared in our magazine about the next great generation, and I think there's some really exciting pieces for them. And, and again, as we talk about these concepts, we're talking about how do we as millennials link to the legacy of wisdom that has come from those before us. And so one of the, the terms that Peter coined that really stands out, uh, it's this right here. Oh, excuse me. That, that's previous slide. It's, it's the knowledge worker. What does it mean to be a knowledge worker? If you don't mind... Dropped out for just a second. Francis, would you tell us a little bit about what it means to be a knowledge worker? Yeah. Um, it's very simple. Knowledge workers use brains. Knowledge workers use their brains. And they are very comfortable with all kinds of communication. And more than any other group, they understand communication is not saying something. Communication is being heard. Mm. And it is um, the knowledge worker must first have the knowledge messages they wish to communicate. And they are very good at distilling the language. We don't need eight paragraphs. A powerful one or two will do it. And the divide between the manual workers and the knowledge worker is vast. And there is a growing number of knowledge workers because of this vast number of millennials entering the workforce. Mm -hmm. And recent studies show that millennials today are more like the workforce of the 30s and 40s than any court cohort since, and may I add, and we call them the greatest generation. I was just going to add too, so I think the thing about um, millennials embodying the knowledge worker is that they absolutely feel like they can be multiple experts in a number of different subjects because they have mm -hmm. access to so much information. And the knowledge worker is someone that never stops in that quest of learning and evolving and contributing. And, uh, and, and ironically, a lot of millennials, regardless of where they're employed, tend to, it, studies are showing that they more often want to start a business, aspire to start a business, or have a side hustle, or they have some type of engagement, whether it be in a nonprofit, serving as a volunteer, or a board member, and I think that really embodies this sense of wanting to be um, a, a lifelong learner and contributor. It's a great point, great point. Paul, as a millennial yourself, what are you seeing? I mean, it's almost to the point that we don't even use that knowledge worker uh, framing anymore because everybody's kind of expected to be that, right? Right. I think it's just part of our um, generation. Um, I, I don't think that a lot of millennials uh, actually think about knowledge uh, work because it is it's part of who we are. It's part of our lives. So definitely I see that the jobs of tomorrow haven't even existed today. And many of these jobs of tomorrow will be knowledge work for sure. 
Yeah, that's a great point. And one of the things in, in Peter's essay on managing oneself, he talks about the importance of knowing one's strengths and weaknesses. And I know that's a really important topic. Uh, I, I personally am a big fan of the work um, that stemmed from uh, Dr. Clifton, Dr. Donald Clifton and the strengths approach. Um, and I know actually tomorrow on the program here, uh, Al Weinsman from the Gallup Institute is going to be joining us. But, but Paul, what are you seeing? You talked a little bit briefly before about strengths and weaknesses. How imperative is it for me as a knowledge worker to know those things? I think it's really huge in this generation. Um, as I said, a lot of these jobs of tomorrow haven't ex even existed today. So that means that we're living in a generation where we have so many options, so many different paths to pursue. And without gaining a greater clarity around who we are, knowing our strengths, our weaknesses, you know, that will really help us to be able to identify a career which we feel will be at our vocational sweet spot. So I think it's absolutely huge to just delve within and to identify what are those strengths and weaknesses and having a really objective understanding of who you are. So how do we learn them, Paul? Right. Um, so as Todd, like you said, you know, Strengths Finder, that's been a huge, I've been a huge fan of Strengths Finder. So for millennials out there who haven't done a lot of these assessments, definitely I think it's a great starter. But one caveat I would say is that a lot of these self-assessments focus on um, based on your limited understanding yourself. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us in our 20s, we're in a period of still discovering who we are. And we can easily deceive ourselves many times when we're trying to, you know, fill out these surveys and we look at these reports because we're still learning about ourselves. So one thing that I think would really help is to um, engage your inner circle of influence, right? So people who are part of your work, part of your church or your personal life, and I, asking them for specific stories about you and asking them to be objective about it and be concrete. And questions such like, um, tell, me when I, tell me a time when I excelled or tell me a time when I was fully alive. I think these are really important questions for us to ask. And once we receive those feedback, our job is then to identify if there's any common themes mm -hmm. that come out of that. And through that, I think we'll be able to kind of get a better understanding of what, what are those things that I do really well and what are some of those weaknesses as, as a leader and how do I mitigate those weaknesses and leverage on my strengths. It's a great point. I, I think uh, you summarized that so, so well. Uh, and again, it... It very much fits what we see from, from uh, Peter Drucker in his, his chapter on managing oneself, the importance of bringing in those advisors, those people that surround us and see us in action. I'm going to move into a, a really interesting question. This is uh, one that I think is a great challenge to all of us, and so I'm just going to kind of open uh, the discussion here for each of the three of you with the question, how can I balance my individual reality with that of others, because that's a big challenge in this 21st century. I think to pick up where Paul left off, which was fantastic advice, Paul, um, one thing that, that I've shared with students is to really think about um, how others perceive you. How mm -hmm. do others see you? So you have that on one side. And the other side is think about how you want them to see you, what you believe is within yourself, and match those up and look to see if there's a gap and that's sort of the roadmap for your development but even more importantly is as to Paul's point is you need to have some allies some mentors some people within your within your personal board of advisors I always have advocated for that I think that's great advice Paul that are willing to have those honest conversations with you another approach I tell students um, and even young professionals at work is to find a success buddy is to find someone a peer a colleague a friend that's around like your same stage in life and in your career and really talk through these concepts and give each other feedback um, and think through questions that you can ask mentors mm -hmm. remember mentors are anywhere they're 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 professors they could be administration 
former colleagues, former managers. So I think that that um, that Paul's right. When you're so overwhelmed and there's that grandiose lifestyle in your face on social media, you can be really easy to get overwhelmed by what others are doing and underwhelmed by your own personal accomplishments. And it's a really important thing, I think, mm -hmm. to center yourself around um, your mission, your personal values first. Mm -hmm. And I think it is so important also to realize that leadership is not a destination. I often have young leaders say to me, I know I'm going to be a real leader, but how will I know when I get there? And I can say leadership is not uh, a destination. Leadership is a journey. We not only choose where and how we are going, but we choose our fellow travelers very carefully. Mm -hmm. I think you had mentioned much the same. Yeah, I think that's such a great point here, and, and I, I, I love the idea of finding other people that are alongside you in the journey. One of the things I think that's really important for us, uh, and I'm going to put my two cents in, and then Paul, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on this, is when we think about uh, the finding of the individual reality with that of others, I think one of the important things that we're learning more and more is the importance of empathy. Uh, mm -hmm. Recognizing the need to find empathy in the other. Um, you know, we're, we're recognizing whether it's organizations like IDEO who are going out and seeking to solve world problems through that idea of first find empathy with the end user or we're talking about even advertisers today. Marketers and advertisers are recognizing until I recognize and have empathy for the person who's going to be using that product, I can't truly design something for them. So I would encourage us to think through the need to find and hold on to that empathic perspective. Paul? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I resonate with everything you guys have been saying. Um, I think, you know, empathy is huge in this generation. I mean, the fact is, I think a lot of millennials, like we're so wide, widely connected these days, uh, but on a very surface level. Like we used to have these one-on-one -on -one relationships with people around us, but now we're having all these more wider connections on on social media, for instance. So one thing that I notice is that people are always tied to their smartphones, mm -hmm. and they're just always just typing away and connecting so although there are great benefits that come with that I think part of it is we lose that sense to really understand and feel the other person so that I think is really the foundation of an emotionally intelligent leader which which is the new style of leadership it's a great yeah. Yeah, and, and one of the things that we're seeing more and more of is this conversation about lifelong learning. Um, if you guys each would, just, just talk briefly about what role learning has played uh, for you and, and also for the knowledge worker in the 21st century. What, what role does learning play? Critical, critical role. And if we do not learn every day, and if learning is not part of our journey, and all kinds of learning and from all kinds of people, then we become part of the past. Mm. But learning and right across the sectors, not just one area, but you look out the window, as Peter Drucker used to say, I look out the window and I see what is visible, but not yet seen. So that's one of our great challenges. It's all out there. It's a great point. Yeah. We look out the window. And our work, and, and clearly yours as well, both of you, is all about opening doors and all about creating and developing and inspiring new resources for emerging leaders particularly, and even tenured leaders, to think about some of these big ideas. But at the end of the day, self-development, if you're looking for your company or your manager to be responsible for you, you've got it all wrong. It's an ownership thing. You own your own self-development. Right. And to Francis's mm. point, 
I think you have to continue to be on that journey to to expose yourself to diverse thinking and, and ideas. And that's the whole point of the Strucker Challenge. It's, it's really P the beauty of Peter's wisdom is to push you to think about things like management and leadership and how you impact others and what's happening inside you and then reflect on how, you know, what the, how that resonates with you, you know, what clicks for you, and then to share that back with the world. And just say two simple Druckerisms. Think first, speak last. Ask. Nice. Don't sell. You know, we've all heard, had people in a room say, I told him, and told him, and told him, and told him, and he still didn't get it. <laughs> No, no, no. Ask yourself. No, I'll, I'll, I'll say I cannot document that this is something that actually occurred, but uh, somebody shared with me recently, uh, somebody came to Peter and they asked him, Peter, how did you get to be so smart? How did you get to be so wise? And his answer to them was, I have CEOs of companies coming in to talk to me, and I listen. And I think that's a foundational part of, of learning is is the willingness to listen. Paul? Mm. Yeah. That's, that's a great point. And I think another thing that I would like to also add to that is uh, just having the sense of inquisitiveness, the sense of curiosity. I think that's the source of true learning is, you know, we can talk about all the strategic reasons of why learning is important and all of that, but unless it's coming from your internal motivation, this intrinsic desire to learn more and to just be curious and just to, and that, that opens up so many doors or opportunities because whenever you're with someone new or or you're reading a book, you're always asking, why? How come? What is this? What is it for? And these questions, I think, would lead us to a deeper inquiry and deeper relationship with a lot of these things. So it's absolutely huge. Definitely. Jen, let me ask you this last question before we start to draw everything to a close. Can anybody actually manage themselves if they don't have an awareness of who they are? Oh, I love that question. Um, yeah. uh, the truth is that that yes, that this is this is an, an, an internal quest, and I think that I also want to point out, as we said earlier, that uh, leadership can start at any age, and we really want to encourage as as young as possible for them to think about and and have that self awareness. I, quick story: I was on a community college campus in New York City, and I saw a young girl carrying around one of uh, Marshall Goldsmith's books, and I thought. Oh, that's interesting. And I thought I'd, I'd grab her and say, "By the way, we have a new book coming out, and Marshall's in it, and he has a new book." And she looked so surprised that I asked her about this book, and um, I asked her, you know, where she got it, and she said, "This is her words." She said, "Well, I know I'm I'm not a real leader myself, but I saw this book on in the sales section, and I thought maybe if I read this, I one day can be." So that mm -hmm. struck that just hit me right here, and that that's. You know that's the purpose of our work, and I told her, absolutely. Is she right now a leader? Absolutely, and she's in control of that. And we gave you know her our information, but I I think that's that's what we have to be a look on the lookout for. Um, there's a lot of pressure and a lot of anxiety being young today in a world that's visible mm -hmm. online everywhere. And I think we want to help them really connect internally to be a better manager and leader of others first. And we. We define leadership as a matter of how to be, not how to do. And for young leaders, that makes sense. Absolutely. Definitely, definitely. Well, let's go ahead and let's let's dig back in, Joan, if you would. Uh, you guys have the the five most important questions. You guys have brought it out. It's done amazingly well. People are getting excited again about the questions. You've uh, shared with us uh, Enduring Wisdom. I love that tagline, the, the, the subtitle, Enduring Wisdom for Today's Leaders. Uh, if you're on our website, there are free excerpts from both, uh, uh, and, and you can also find it at druckerchallenge.org and whymillennialsmatter.org, or .com, excuse me. You can find excerpts of the book. You can also find an excerpt from uh, Managing for the 21st Century. Uh, which is Peter's book and, and the chapter on managing oneself, which is part of the Drucker Challenge. And then bring us back here to where we're all talking about this challenge, Joan. 
give us that, that reminder about how do we get involved in it and what does it look like for us to think about this question. Yes, so DruckerChallenge.org is where you go to get the direct information and you can find it on all of our sites as well, but this is such an exciting opportunity. I promise you if I challenge everyone that's listening today or who watches this to just download that free chapter that Peter wrote on managing oneself, it will hit home. It will help you be more reflective about your own path to leadership. Um, again, we talked about our strengths, our contribution, who you surround yourself with, the community that really work to help you flourish and help you excel in life and feel satisfied. So the DruckerChallenge.org, again, the deadline is July 15th. You have to submit an essay between 1,500 to 3,000 words. Um, I would encourage you to work with a, with a mentor or a friend, have someone review um, your essay before you submit it, but don't hesitate. I think don't second guess yourself or your thoughts or your ideas. Everybody has something to add in this conversation. And again, the, the prizes are incredible. They are saving 20 seats um, for the, the, top, the top winners um, to attend the challenge itself in Vienna, Austria. And then you're connected to this unbelievable, dynamic, and really thoughtful community of other Drucker fans and followers. Absolutely. Folks, let me just again reiterate. This has been an amazing journey, and, and the four of us are on this call today simply because we believe in it. We, we believe in, in the enduring wisdom of, of Peter Drucker. We believe in the enduring wisdom, not only of, of Peter, but in those that have taken to, to, to heart the things that Peter taught. Um, we sit here, I know Paul, Joan, and myself, we sit here and, and we learn uh, consistently from Francis. Francis, you ha have, have really lived that legacy well. You're teaching each of us so many amazing things, and I'm so thankful to uh, your work at the, the Francis Hesselbein Leadership Institute of what you've done. Thankful to Joan at Why Millennials Matter and what she's doing, to Paul in his leadership legacy that he's building in young leaders. And folks, we're so thrilled to be part of this journey. We want to say thank you to the Young Nonprofit Professional Network. Uh, they've been very helpful in helping to publicize uh, this great work, and they serve really to help promote in this third sector uh, what the good and, and perfect legacy uh, of Peter Drucker is as we think about moving forward. Uh, again, reminder, check out what's happening. There's some amazing things that are occurring with the Drucker Challenge and the International Drucker Forum. A great opportunity, as Joan shared with us today, to be able to get involved with it. And, and we've just, just barely touched the tip of the iceberg in this discussion. So, so many places for you to go. Francis, Joan, Paul, if you guys want to leave us here with one last word of wisdom, uh, and then we'll close. Uh, I would say leave Peter Drucker's wisdom with you. Think first, speak last, ask, don't tell. And when they walk around and you understand leadership is a matter of how to be, mm -hmm. not how to do, then you are well along that journey to effective leadership. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Todd, we, Francis and I both want to say thank you so much. You've been such a phenomenal yes. um, partner, um, Center Vision, uh, nonprofit, performance magazine. You just inspire us with how hands-on and how passionate you are about your work. And so I think that that's what I, what I would even echo in my closing thoughts are that I think seeing someone like you and how you are a lifelong learner and you love to connect and ask people about their thoughts and questions, um, that's why we wanted to spread the word about the Drucker Challenge. I, I hope that everyone that's, that's listening, that reads this, that tunes in later, knows that they all have an important mm -hmm. message to share. We all want to hear it, and this is an opportunity to do so. Absolutely. Paul? Yeah, thanks so much again, everyone, uh, for giving me the opportunity to be here. Uh, as a millennial myself, I think there, this is a very important message that I hope that a lot of my fellow millennials would watch and be able to understand the the impact of Peter Drucker's legacy on the next generations of leaders. So thanks again for giving the give me the opportunity to be here.
Absolutely. Folks, we're, we're so thrilled to have you in with us. Uh, please share this video. It's opportunity to be able to share with your colleagues, your friends, mentors, and mentees. Uh, it'll be up on podcasts on iTunes. We'll be able to share this, and we really want to build, uh, whether you're going to Vienna for the Drucker Forum or you're going to be able to participate in the live stream of it, we really believe that there's lasting wisdom here for each of us to attain, no matter how old or young we are, we're all lifelong learners. Thanks yeah. for joining us. So thrilled again to have the Hesselbein Leadership Institute, Why Millennials Matter, Paul Son of paulson.com. Uh, you can take a look at all the work that they're doing. Each one of us stands here because we believe that we have an opportunity to engage and develop leaders as we go forward. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate having you in with us on today's conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.